All right. Well, let's um, let's go ahead and begin by reading the psalm we're looking at this evening, which I'm sure I really don't have to read. We probably all have it memorized, but something that um, I don't think we apply as broadly as we we should. Um, I think we look at this psalm when we're either faced with death or somebody that we know is faced with death, but we don't really look at it so much uh, when we're faced with life. And I think. Um, I think that's what the Lord intends for us uh, to do as we're going to see this evening. So let's read this Psalm of David as we begin, Psalm 23. David writes this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, may the Lord grant us uh, a blessing from this psalm this evening as we spend a few moments thinking about it. Now, uh, as you've already been reminded this evening, over the past few Lord's Day evenings, uh, we've been looking at a few things that I think can help strengthen our desire to reach out to the lost uh, with the gospel. And really, I think uh, the essence of our difficulty does boil down to a desire, not that we lack it entirely, but that we lack it to the degree that we need in order to break through all the barriers that stand in our way in reaching out to others. Now, we've been looking at some of the things perhaps that will help us do that. We've looked at some of the incentives, the motives that the Lord has given to us, not the least of which we see every Lord's Day when we have the Lord's Table. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us to save us and he calls us to lay down our lives for others to bring the gospel to them. Uh, the Lord promises to reward every effort that we make to reach out to others with the gospel to serve him in any way. Uh, so we ought to be looking to that reward. And of course one thing that I've at least been trying to emphasize and I think it's a very important one, is that in giving us the gospel to share with others, the Lord has actually given to us the highest honor that he can possibly bestow upon any of his creatures. Uh, he could have given it to the angels, as I've said on numerous occasions, the angels would have taken it up and they would have joyfully done it. Uh, they would have been very glad to have that, but the Lord hasn't given it to them. Uh, he has given the gospel to us. We are the ones through whom others need to hear it, we are his messengers. That's true. But we saw that these incentives, these things the Lord has given to us to motivate us are only going to help us if we strongly believe that they are true. And they will only help us to the degree that we believe them uh, to be true. So if they are to be more effective, we need a stronger faith since the strength of our faith is going to depend how clearly, or is going to be the depending factor upon how clearly we see these things. And of course, since the strength of our faith depends upon uh, how much we have of the Holy Spirit, we need to strengthen His work in our souls. The more we can free ourselves from those things that quench the Spirit's work, the more we can free ourselves from the distracting influences of sin and of the world, and the more that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the stronger our faith is going to be, the more clearly we're going to see the truth and reality of the things the Lord tells us about in His Word, and the more they're going to influence us to act on them. Now again, as I said before, ultimately what we need is a greater desire to do the Lord's will. We need a stronger love for the Lord to yield to Him, to want to please Him, to want to honor Him in this way. We won't be as effective as we might otherwise be in this work unless we love him to this degree. And again, how much does the Lord call us to love him? But with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, he wants us to love him with every faculty. Uh, all the strength of, of every fiber of our being is to be focused upon him. 
Now, of course, we are to love also our neighbors. We love ourselves, but really that is to be the, the byproduct of our love for the Lord. Uh, we are to love him, and, of course, he commands us to love others. So out of our love for him, we are to love others. So again, the strength of this love really depends upon the work of the Spirit of God in our souls again. And one way to strengthen it is to cut off the things that weaken it. Another way to strengthen it, of course, is to use the means God has given us to strengthen those things. But one of the things that I wanted to focus on that he does give us to focus the work or to strengthen the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts is basically his promises, meditating on his promises. All of God's word is really a means by which the Spirit of God can strengthen us. But I think one of the things that perhaps strengthens us or the Spirit can use more than any other are the wonderful promises that he has actually made to us in the Lord Jesus Christ because all these promises come out of his love and they are meant to help us do what he has called us to do. So I thought that we could meditate on a few of these promises and as we do, the Spirit of God can use them to build us up in love, in holy love so that we will give ourselves more to him. And of course, Psalm 23 is full of promise. It is full of comfort. And that's one of the reasons why it's the, one of the, well, the first Psalms that we turn to when we're going through tough times and we're going through difficulties, particularly when we are faced, as I've said before, with, with death, uh, whether it be our own death or perhaps the death of a loved one. We don't have to wait until it reaches that point. We don't have to wait till we're faced with that kind of a situation for the situation to get that serious before we can begin to use Psalm 23. It can yield its comforts to us now in this work the Lord calls us to uh, in evangelism. Now, as you've already heard this evening, Jesus said to his disciples before he uh, sent them out, after he gave them the Great Commission, a commission that would take them and really the, the church, the rest of human history to accomplish, which is the evangelization of the world. He says in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we understand what the Lord is telling us here in, in general terms, uh, that he's going to be with us, he's going to help us. But what does he mean more specifically? And what can we expect the Lord to do for us? What can we expect from him as we set out to, to do this work? Well, I think we can expect essentially what David expected from the Lord in Psalm 23, that which a shepherd would do for his sheep. So I thought we would look at the psalm from that perspective, that as we devote ourselves to the Lord to do his work while we're here on earth, that he will be with us to provide everything uh, that we need. Now again, we're, we're wanting to, I think, as, as we've lately been coming to Scripture, we're wanting to focus all that the Lord promises, all that he commands us, all that he wants us to be, all that he wants us to do for his glory on this particular work because this is the main thing that he wants us to do. Everything revolves around this because this is how he gives glory and honor to his son isn't it? By gathering in the sheep for which Jesus laid down his life. Every single soul that converts to the Lord Jesus Christ, that turns to him and trusts him, becomes a part of his reward. And everything that we are to do for them, everything we are to do to help them and to train them, to get them into the field, is to multiply this reward that our Father has for Christ. So we need to see the Great Commission as the central work the Lord calls us to do. And everything the Lord does for us is essentially to help us to do this work. So let's, as I've said before, look at the psalm from this perspective and realize that the Lord, as we set out to do his work, is, has basically committed himself to do what it is we see, David says, the Lord would do for him in this psalm. Well, first of all, let's just consider the author of the psalm. And by that I mean the human author of the psalm. Uh, we know that the author of all of Scripture is the Holy Spirit, ultimately. We, but we also know that he used human instruments to write uh, his word down. Now, he didn't do that by way of dictation, although there are instances where he did, where he says, take up a pen and write, or thus saith the Lord, you know, write this down, and so forth. Uh, 
he doesn't normally do it that way, nor did he normally simply cause the, the writers of Scripture to kick their brains into neutral as they gave control over to the Holy Spirit and then began to sort of write down what, what he wanted. That's not the way the Lord gave his word. But rather, he used human instruments, and he used their education, he used their vocabulary, he used their experiences, and he even used the situations in which they were in, in which they were writing to communicate his word, everything he wanted us to know about how to live the life that he calls us to live. Now, the human author in this case was David, and I, I bring that out because I, I do think it, it matters. Remember who David was. Remember what he was doing when the Lord called him. David was a shepherd. Uh, he writes about his relationship with the Lord as that of a sheep to a shepherd because having been a shepherd, he understand this is what the Lord was to him. As I said, one of the reasons why the Lord called David and chose him to be the king over Israel was because of his past work experience. It wasn't you know, the only reason. It's because David had a heart you know, after, after basically God's own heart. Uh, he loved the things the Lord loved. He loved the Lord. He wanted to do God's will. But he also had this experience, which is very important. Uh, the psalmist writes regarding David in Psalm 78, verses 70 through 72, he also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. Basically, the skills that David developed while he was in the wilderness taking care of the sheep were the skills that the Lord was using in his life to apply to the nation of Israel. God wanted him to do for Israel what he had done for his sheep. But the only way that David could actually do that was if the Lord was to David what David had been to his sheep. In other words, David couldn't be the shepherd of Israel unless he had the Lord as his shepherd and neither can we essentially do what the Lord calls us to do unless we also have a shepherd like the one David had. Now, we do need to understand we do have that relationship that David had with the Lord. We have the same relationship that he had because we both share the same Lord. Uh, Jesus tells us as much in John chapter 10, as we've already seen, that if we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if we belong to him, we are his sheep and he is our shepherd. Jesus says in John 10, verses 14 through 16, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now again, is this the first time Jesus took up the staff, as it were, took up the rod and began to shepherd? No, he is the shepherd of Israel. He is the one who was shepherding Israel. He was the one who has been shepherding his people uh, throughout history. Now, who better to describe the kind of relationship that the Lord has with us than one who actually experienced it himself, having also been a shepherd himself? So it is important that we understand David's background to understand what he is actually saying here regarding this perspective of his relationship with the Lord. So what does David tell us are the benefits of having the Lord as our shepherd? Uh, not uh, unusually, he sums up virtually everything he wants to tell us in the very first statement. In verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Basically, having the Lord as our shepherd means that we will not lack any good thing that we need, either to survive or to do what the Lord has actually called us to do. Now the Lord basically is, is telling us, or David is telling us, that the Lord does for us what he requires of everyone who is in an authority. And here's another way perhaps we can apply this psalm because what the Lord is to us and what David was to Israel is what the Lord wants everyone who is in authority to do for those who are under their authority. So he does for us 
what the husband is to do for his wife. Remember how Christ says, you know, husbands love your wives as, as Christ loved the church. Uh, we are, as parents, to do this for our children. As elders, we are to do this for those in our congregation. Magistrates are to do this for the citizens in the particular area in which you know, they're serving. And what is it that they're supposed to do? They're supposed to care for those under their charge. They're supposed to care for the flock. Uh, Isaiah, looking forward to our Lord Jesus Christ, basically gives us a picture of what it is that he would do for us in Isaiah 40, verse 11. He writes, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. It is the work of our great shepherd to care for our souls, basically not just our souls, but also our bodies. It is our, his work uh, to care for us. It is our work to follow him. The shepherd cares for the sheep. The sheep follow the shepherd. Now, obviously, the work that our Lord Jesus calls us to do requires a great deal of help. Uh, we need a great shepherd. How is it that this shepherd is able to provide everything that we need? Well, that, I think, is given to us again in the first verse because look at who David says our shepherd is. Uh, he is the Lord. By the way, look at this correlation between Jesus as our shepherd and, of course, uh, the Lord as the shepherd of Israel because we're really talking about the same person here. Our shepherd is the Lord. This is the covenant name of God. As you know, in Hebrew, it is Yahweh. Basically, it means I am. I am the, eternal, the eternally existed one, the one who never changes. Yahweh is the name of the triune God, and it applies to each of the persons of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God who made all things, the God who... Uh, upholds all things, sustains all things, and moves everything along according to his sovereign plan. This is the one who is our shepherd. He is the one who became one with us that he might be the good shepherd of our souls, that he might take on himself the responsibility of our care to provide everything that we need, both physically and spiritually, so that we might do his work. And of course, that we might uh, be kept safe through it and that we might eventually arrive safely in heaven. Our Lord Jesus provides everything that we need. Now we do need to make a careful distinction here. It's not everything that we want uh, unless of course what we want is what God wants for us but you know how people take this and, and they twist it to say well God's going to make me rich. He's going to do all this and that. But the Lord won't give you anything that will destroy you. He will only give you those things that will help you. He will give you those things that you need. That is what he is pledged to do. Now what are some of the specific benefits that the Lord gives to us as our shepherd and we as sheep? Well, we can, I think as we read what David writes here, we can, we can see that David is writing from the perspective of his years of experience as a shepherd. And we can see those images. We can see the sheep being, you know, lying down in the green pastures, uh, being led beside the still waters and so forth. And we understand what that means when it comes to a shepherd and his literal sheep. But we do have to take those images and, and sort of bring them across into what it is that the Lord actually is doing for us. And there may be a bit of interpretive latitude here when it comes to applying these things to our Lord's care for us because I'm not sure we can be hard and fast in each of these images but I'll, I will tell you this though these images give us a complete picture of care of everything that we need to sustain us everything we need to protect us everything we need to empower us everything we need to take away our fear of doing what the Lord calls us to do so what what are some of the things he mentions here well the first thing he says is in verse 2 he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Um, most literally, the Lord says he provides food and refreshment. And I think some have included here a little bit of the idea of safety because you're lying down, as it were, and not in a state of alarm. 
for our bodies and for our souls. I mean, green pastures, what are they for? Well, for the sheep to graze in, for the sheep to lie down in, to rest and be refreshed. And what about leading us beside the quiet waters? Um, literally, I think what, um, what it says in Hebrew is that he leads us to the quiet waters, not just beside them, but to them so we can drink. Now this is what the Good Shepherd does in providing for his sheep, and this is what the Lord does for us. He provides for us the things we need physically and spiritually in order to sustain us. I think it's quite clear in Scripture that the Lord has promised to do both for us. I mean, for instance, the Lord teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, by which we understand everything that we need to sustain us. And he tells us that as our good shepherd, this is what he is going to provide for us. Later in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 31 through 33, Jesus tells his disciples this, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, is Jesus telling us here, don't work, don't pursue your secular calling uh, because God's going to take care of you? Well, no, if he's called you to do the things that you're doing, that is how he is determined he's going to provide for you. But he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about your job, whether you're going to keep it. Don't worry about your finances, whether you're going to have what you need. But rather, seek his interests, his kingdom, his righteousness first, and he will provide all these things either through that job or through some other means. The Lord will provide. He is the good shepherd who takes care of you. And of course, if it applies to the lesser concerns, although they are still concerns, I mean, we, we don't just throw care to the winds and don't worry about what we eat or drink. We need those things. But if the Lord's going to take care of those things, we know that he's going to take care of the greater needs that we have. Uh, he promises also to meet our spiritual needs. Jesus in the gospel, through his work, has become for us our source of spiritual Life, spiritual health, spiritual strength, spiritual food. In the Lord Jesus Christ is fullness of grace. As a matter of fact, when John is comparing the new covenant to the old covenant, he calls it grace in place of grace or instead of grace or grace upon grace because of the, the grace that our Lord Jesus Christ provides in this covenant. The Lord says that he becomes to those who find him the source of of heavenly food. He is the manna from heaven. He is the living bread that gives life to the soul and sustains that life. He is the one to the one who trusts in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That which gives joy to the soul, this fullness of joy and blessing in the Holy Spirit. He is our spiritual food and our spiritual drink. He is the shepherd who provides everything we need to sustain and satisfy our bodies and our souls. That's what David is telling us that the Lord did for him. That is what our Lord Jesus Christ does for us. So we don't have to try to fill the void in our lives of desires in our lives with empty things that aren't going to satisfy. The Lord has given us something that satisfies forever. Uh, far better than anything that the world has. Remember, uh, again, this comment that Edwards made. The things, everything outside of God is basically limited. It's finite. And we're going to run to the end of the joy and the happiness those things can give us very quickly. But we never will run to the end of the joy and happiness that one who is infinite can give us. Which is why we need to find our satisfaction in him. And he promises here he will provide for us. Now secondly, David says when we go astray, he will seek after us. And he will restore us. And he will bring us back. And he will lead us on the path of righteousness in verse 3. David writes, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, sin is constantly at work in our lives, constantly trying to draw us away from the Lord. We need restoration. We need a, a, a shepherd. We need a savior who is going to bring us back. 
Now, of all the domesticated animals, it's been said sheep are those that are most prone, most likely to wander. David says, we are the Lord's sheep. And even the best of us are prone to wander away from him. None of us are above falling. The psalmist who wrote Psalm 119 in verse 176 says this, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on Psalm 23, writes this, The best saints miss their way and turn aside into bypaths. But when God shows them their error, gives them repentance, and brings them back to their duty again, he restores the soul. And if he did not do so, they would wander endlessly and be undone. When after one sin, David's heart smote him, and after another, Nathan was sent to tell him, Thou art the man, God restored his soul. Though God may suffer or allow his people to fall into sin, he will not allow them to lie still in it. Uh, the Lord goes after his sheep. The Lord reclaims his sheep. The Lord restores us and puts us back on the path. Now, David tells us he not only brings us back to the path that we left. I kind of can't help but think of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, you know, the idea of bypath meadows and everything else that just always coming back to the path. The Lord is the one who eventually brings us back. If we belong to him, that's what he does is our good shepherd. But once he brings us back, he leads us in the good and the right paths of his word. He doesn't just stick us back on the path and, and leave us, but he gives us something to follow. And of course, it's his word. Again, Matthew Henry writes this, these are the paths in which all the saints desire to be led and kept and never to turn aside out of them. And those only are led by the still waters of comfort that walk in the paths of righteousness. The way of duty is the truly pleasant way. It is the work of righteousness that is peace. In these paths, we cannot walk unless God both lead us into them and lead us in them. You see, it's the path that, as Christians, we desire to walk. We want to follow the Savior, and He is walking in the path of righteousness. That's where He is. If we're going to walk with God, He's in the light. He's going the way of righteousness. He's going the right way. So if we're going to follow him, that's where we need to be, but that's where we want to be because as his sheep, we love the Savior. We want to go his direction, and it is our grief when we go out of the way. But our shepherd says when we do, he will reclaim us. When we do, he will lead us. So we, again, need to follow. It's his work to guide us. It's our work to follow. Thirdly, David says, he keeps us safe from danger. And this one I think is particularly important as we think about the work of evangelism. We think about living in the world that we're living in. We need to know the Lord is with us to protect us. He says in verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I think David here isn't saying when I'm drawing near to death, but when I'm in a situation that is threatening my life. Uh, a valley was a very dangerous place for the sheep and for the shepherd who was trying to take care of his sheep because there were so many shadows that were cast by the valley, as you know, as you've seen valleys, and there's places where predators could be hiding in the valley. But sometimes it was unavoidable. The shepherd had to take his sheep through that valley. And these valleys are also unavoidable in the Christian life. Everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus is going to face danger, is going to suffer tribulation and persecution. But even when the Lord's path takes us through the valley, we don't need to be afraid because the Lord is with us. He says his rod and his staff, they comfort us. Now I know we usually think of a rod as something that we kind of strike things with, but I don't think that that is the idea here with regard to the rod. The rod is, is something that the shepherd used to basically corral his sheep into the sheepfold and to count them as they would go through. They would pass underneath uh, the rod into the sheepfold. Now we have passed under that rod if we're trusting in Jesus. If we are in the sheepfold, if we have come through the door, 
which um, remember that's what Jesus says he is in John chapter 10, we have the promise of eternal life and we will never perish. That is a comfort to us as we face the valley of the shadow of death. His rod comforts us, his promise that we will not perish. But his staff also comforts us. Now the staff had basically two functions. It was used to, uh, to fight off those, those animals, those predators that were coming after the sheep. And certainly if your shepherd has a weapon to defend you with, that's a comfort. But it was also used to strike the sheep if they went astray and to bring them back, as it were, into the path. In other words, it could also be what we usually think of as the rod of discipline. And the Lord's discipline in our lives is also a comfort to us because it reminds us, as the author to the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12, that we belong to him, that he loves us. Because what child is there that a parent would not discipline? The Lord will discipline his sheep. The Father will discipline his children. And that is a comfort to us because if the Lord is disciplining us, if we belong to him, and if we know that he will never lose us, then there is nothing ultimately that can harm us. Not even death can harm us. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ has taken uh, the sting out of death, which is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Paul actually looked forward to death because he knew death would simply bring him into the presence of his Lord. And that's what our Lord Jesus has done for us. That's what the shepherd has done for us. But the comfort isn't only in death. It's also in his protection. And remember, you and I are not going to die a moment sooner than what the Lord has actually planned for us. And until then, we're invincible. Not that we put ourselves unnecessarily in danger because of that. But when the path of duty leads us into the path of danger, we do need to remember the Good Shepherd is with us. David goes on to say that he will bless us even in the face of our opponents, of our enemies. In verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And here we have just the image again of during difficult times. We're still going to experience the Lord's refreshing presence, his blessings, his joy, not just a little, but to overflowing like a feast in the wilderness in front of our enemies, like having our heads anointed with oil, which to our way of thinking might seem like something we don't want to experience, having oil dumped on your head. But in those days, that was something that was a comfort and a blessing to those who received it. And certainly having your cup overflow, you know, and not go dry, not go empty. It just talks about the Lord's abundance in the middle of even our enemy's opposition. So that even when we do good and we suffer for it, we are still, as it were, refreshed or blessed from within. I just thought of that image that um, Greg and I were talking about the other day that's in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Mr. Interpreter's House. You have this wall with a fire at the, at the base of the wall and there's a, there's a man who's pouring water on the, wa on the fire trying to put it out and yet the fire doesn't go out. And so then he goes behind the wall, not the man with the water, but, but interpreter and, and pilgrim, and they see why the, the fire doesn't go out. It's because there's a man behind the wall who's secretly feeding the fire with, with fuel. So the one trying to put the fire out is the devil who's trying to extinguish the grace that's in the heart of the Christian, but the Lord Jesus isn't going to allow it to go out. He keeps feeding it secretly. And I think what David is telling us here is that even in the midst of difficult situations that might otherwise extinguish the grace of God in us, if it were left just to us, the Lord will sustain us and he will cause that fire to burn even more brightly. I believe that image is there as well. The more Satan tries to put out the fire, the more brightly it burns. Because in the midst of this adversity, our Lord is giving us an abundance of his presence. Fifthly, David says, this will continue, not only to the end of our lives, but to the end of time. He says in the final verse, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we see everything that the Lord has done for us in our lives up to this point and we've, you know, we've seen his faithfulness in providing for us and sustaining us and protecting us and we've felt his rod of fatherly discipline, 
we know that we belong to him and we know from his word that he's going to continue to do that. He's not going to stop because he doesn't just start a work and then, and then give it up. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1, I know that that work he began in you, that he will complete to the day of Jesus Christ. And when our time on earth is over, the Lord's going to take us home to be in his house with him forever. Jesus says in my father's mansion, or there are many dwelling places, and, my, and you know, I, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, the Lord is going to come again and take us to be with him. So basically, the Lord has pledged to care for all of our needs as, as our good shepherd, as our great shepherd, giving food and refreshment to soul and body, bringing us back to himself when we go astray, leading us in the good and right paths, keeping us safe from dangers, the dangers in this world, even those things that might threaten to take us away from him, which cannot. Uh, blessing us in the face of opposition with, again, this abundance and this overflowing joy and happiness throughout the entirety of our lives and even for the rest of of time. Now that is what the Lord has said he has pledged to do for us. That's what the Good Shepherd does for us. But let's not forget there is something he expects from us. There is a reason why he, he does these things. He gives us these things because he loves us, because the shepherd loves his sheep and lays down his life for the sheep. But he also does it because we need this help. We need these blessings to be able to do the work that he has called us to do. Now, we need to believe, as I said before, we need to trust the Lord. We need to believe that he is actually going to do these things. And surely, if, if you've been doing, you know, what it is the Lord has called you to do, you've seen that provision. If you've walked with him for any length of time, you know he is faithful to do all these things. But as we think about, again, faith's checkbook, you know, the idea that we've got these promises, we need to cash them in, we need to bank on them they're only going to do us any good if we actually act upon them. We actually believe the Lord, trust the Lord, and then step out knowing that he's going to take care of us in this way because if we don't trust him and if we don't apply these promises, we likely will not be able to push through those uncomfortable barriers that keep us from doing what the Lord calls us to do. So since he has provided these things, since he has pledged himself to do them, since our Lord Jesus Christ sealed his promises with his blood and set the new covenant in motion, which basically provides this good shepherd and all of these blessings, let's be encouraged to move forward knowing that the Lord will be with us as he promised that he would. And then one last thing is, let's also be thankful that if we belong to the Lord and we still, after these encouragements, don't move forward, that he is going to be faithful to go out and seek us and get us back on the right path so that we begin to do what the Lord calls us to do. Remember, what the Lord calls us to do what is, is our duty. They're not, they're not optional things. If our hearts are right, it is a delightful duty. We want to do these things. We want to follow the shepherd. We want to share Christ with others. But if we don't do it, the Lord doesn't kick us out of his house, but rather he goes after us and he puts us back on the path and he gets, moves, gets us to move forward again. He doesn't just say, you know, go on without me. But he, he goes ahead of us and he leads us. He has an interest in making sure that we stay on that path and that we do what it is he has called us to do because ultimately it is going to lead to our blessing as well as, of course, his glory. So let's be thankful that, that the Lord will help us either way do what it is that we need to do because he is the good shepherd who cares for our souls. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in just a moment of silent prayer and let's thank the Lord and uh, ask him to help us follow him.